Hi there, my name's Laura and I'm the back half of Stella Tandem, a record-breaking attempt to cycle around the world on tandem bicycle in 2022. And this is Stoked to Be Here, a podcast where we speak to people from the worlds of endurance and cycling to get tips and tricks for our adventure. Today, I'm massively excited to be joined by Tandem Wow, who are Kat and Raz, who hold the female circumnavigation record on Tandem Bicycle. So I can't wait to hear about their amazing ride. Welcome to you both. Oh, thank you. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi there. Um, yes, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us, because I say you've um, been a major influence on us uh, taking on this challenge. So it would be great to, to hear a bit more about your trip. Um, could you tell us a bit more about how it kind of started, how it came about? Um, maybe Rachel, you could, yeah, kind of um, well, let I us guess, know. Um, Kat and I met really when we were doing a, a charity ride from London to Paris. And um, I hadn't been riding that long, but I absolutely loved it. We got on well, um, but I wasn't as fit as Kat <laughs> and so kind of was in her and she was on the, a tandem and we, I was kind of uh, in their in their wake a lot of the time but actually um, the more we cycled together uh, the fitter I got the better I got we became kind of very compared kind of reasonable um, cycling buddies and Kat had lots of uh, loads of ideas of things she wanted to do and uh, things just grow really. <laughs> spiral out of all proportion yeah, yeah I know that yeah. feeling so Kat were you a tandem rider before was that something you'd already kind of taken part in or yeah so I so I I um I, I had ridden a tandem before um also you know solo so I don't you know in fact we both still ride solos um as well as as well as tandems but um I happen to be doing the London to Paris on a on a tandem and then we, when we started you know when we started training we, we actually did quite a lot on solos so we did you know kind of some of the really big sportifs you know so we went out to uh you know rode the alps and you know some of the coals and things like that and, and i guess you know it, it just sort of um uh, i think we're having a conversation one day and i said i always fancied riding around the world and then it turned into well you know let's try and you know do it on a tandem and let's break the world record and and that's what we did. So, um, so as well as holding the, um, you know, the female uh, record, fortunately, um, you know, we've 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 done it the fastest ever. So we um, we broke the men's record by um, seventeen and a half days in the in the end. So, uh, so yeah, we it was an amazing amazing experience for sure. Yeah, and me and Raz were just saying that before we came on that yeah, it's um it's very nice to have a almost a little bit of role reversal there that it's not the the men that um hold the the absolute title and that yeah currently it's you two that it um trumped them as it were which I, I think is is amazing and I think that's a very inspiring part of your your story really you went out and showed them how it could be done yeah. and I think um we kind of I mean some of the guys we met and stayed in the same places that they'd stayed in which was uh which was quite funny it's a small world a small tandem world and they they were as i said um before the both sets of guys were really supportive and uh but there was one person we stayed with in australia and they thought we were in really good nick we were clean we had clean washing <laughs> we uh, well obviously didn't have beards down to our, our kind of elbows but you know generally i think um we did it in style too <laughs> they did. yeah definitely <laughs> I can see there's definitely some some um, big pros to having yeah a, a two woman team as it were think, yeah <laughs> a lot less smelly lot of, yeah a lot of uh, on a lot of le levels we're a bit more organised but um, yeah it was good they did yeah. no beards anyway yeah, yeah. That's what, that would be quite concerning if we suddenly develop beards. <laughs> like <laughs> Yeah, I think um, Steve, my husband, has more than enough beard for, for <laughs> everybody involved. So. <laughs> Um, so uh, how did you um because were you living in the same place at that point when you were training and everything for this so, so did you have to make kind of a big effort to to get training together I mean where are you based um that's just arousal <laughs> um well I'm in Oxford and Kat is in York um and London but um as as she mentioned we we had to do quite a bit of training on our own and then um together we 
do meet up and have met up, but in the kind of in the middle, in the peaks. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's not always easy being so far, living so far apart. No, I can imagine. And yeah, you know, we, um, me and Steve, we ride separately solo bikes as well, quite a lot of the time for, for our own training, but there's a definite benefit to getting together. And it's, it's a different skill riding tandem. I think there's, it's, um, yeah, you've got to have a, a lot of communication and yeah, it's um, uh, a bit of a different dynamic to riding solo. So I think it's, it's really interesting that Kat was already riding tandem beforehand. That was something I didn't actually know, which, yeah, cause it's not a, it's not, common I think in the cycling world I think a tandem on the road is still a bit of a anomaly mm. yeah I mean I think you know you 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 get to the point where it's intuitive though you know I mean obviously when you first start as a team together you know that you, you do have to communicate a lot more than uh, you know we did in the end because we just <laughs> we were just so used to riding together and um, you know Raz and I would know exactly what I was going to do when I do it so, so we we don't we don't swap positions as well so um, you know we just got to a point where you know the team the team just sort of worked and we just kind of knew each other sort of very instinctively I think yeah because that's one of the things you always get asked isn't it do you swap front and back yeah. but it's 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 not that simple really is it I think yeah. well, I think the stoke is quite a specific and position <laughs> also um you know on the way through france i had uh, my left foot particularly was really burning at you know after a, kind of a couple of hours it really started to burn and then it didn't really disappear and sometimes i had to stop and just walk around just to get rid of that and then um after a couple of days we just tried to um change the cleat just fractionally um and it completely went it took it off the uh, the nerve and it completely went so when you set something up so accurately and so acutely for your comfort it's really hard then to um because cat and i have slightly different saddles and different heights and you know the handlebars and the different and it was built specifically for us with our measurements of how you know for our comfort because cat also has a i think you have a kind of a further reach than um i i kind of cat has a bigger a distance and um it's just because we were kind of going for so many hours each day to change to cycle that length of time when you're not comfortable because it was just like just perfect where we were <laughs> so we didn't have to change and I think had we changed we'd been faffing around with trying to get things right and then messing it up for the person who you know cat touched my saddle <laughs> you, you, you really it took you so long to get it just right and even tape and taping it didn't um you know, didn't get it quite right if you uh, re redid it. So, um, yeah, it was very, very uh, precise. Yeah, it's my micro adjustments, really, mm -hmm. I think, when mm -hmm. you're doing that sort of distance, you know. So, but but that's how we ride, you know. So I'm pilot and um, I'm Stokes and uh, and that's the team. And, and, and we ride sort of very, very intuitively now, you know. And I think the other thing about riding tandem is, you know, it's, it's a very different experience riding fully loaded laden tandem as well than it is to uh you know to stop going out um you know because it's it, get, it gets pretty pretty heavy when it's uh when it's fully fully loaded for sure yeah definitely you definitely feel it on on the hills don't you <laughs> you just grind to a halt and i think i saw a comment on a, a tandem group a while back saying oh no you know no bother with hills and i think you, i don't think you've you've ridden a fully laden tandem have you because <laughs> it's a different kettle of fish we, we did sure we did never get off we didn't stop on hills we just kind of grind ground it out really yeah yeah you've just got to sit down settle down and accept it <laughs> yeah i mean we could go going from from going downhill to uphill you'd be going down at about 45 50 miles an hour and then hit the bottom and then go back up and it goes 49 48 <laughs> down to three <laughs> and then you'd kind of go yeah three three and then it would just say it was kind of um, halted because you go so slow but <laughs> yeah we, it, it worked we did it we and I have yeah. to say I do have to say one thing that uh, I can say now because I wasn't allowed to say it at the time but we we never fell off and we didn't crash we didn't fall off and uh yeah cats are, cats are brilliant yeah, pilot, so that. that was pretty cool even when we were going <laughs> nil miles, miles an hour, how you managed to keep kind of us balanced is uh, 
was amazing. I, yeah, it used to be like um, Nintendo level 13 going through some of the Indian Indian villages and that there there's people everywhere. I just ride the bike through and <laughs> sort of dodging everybody, stage like track with like a track stand on a fully loaded um, tandem with both of us as we yeah yeah. But it's um, yeah, you know, you just got because you've just on the bike so much, you just kind of got got used to it. It was sort of second nature. The funny thing was when I when I got back and I got on my my solo you know, my nice little carbon, I nearly fell off mm. because um, <laughs> it was so different. And I, uh, I put my put my foot down and, and it sort of whizzed forward and I, I very nearly, I couldn't, I couldn't get off the saddle. It was ridiculous. So it took me, it took me a while to um, actually adjust to riding, uh, you know, sort of a, a normal, a normal solo after, after that. <laughs> Yeah, it's a tough job on the front, I think, riding, uh, you know, holding everything and, and yeah, negotiating the weight and everything like that. So, but I think, you know, it's, it is, and it's very much that kind of shared jobs and, and shared responsibilities. And, um, you know, I think I've heard that you, in the run up to the trip as well, you kind of developed specific areas where you were responsible for. How did you kind of split those between you? Um, um, it, we didn't consciously do that at all. It just naturally happened. Uh, I was um, busy doing some things and Kat had, was focused on the route and I was thinking about sponsorship, um, equipment, kind of getting it. Kat, we discussed what we wanted, then I would um, try to source it and things. So we, um, I don't know, it just it just happened that that's, that's what we do. Yeah, Russ could persuade people to actually give up their firstborn child. So she was very <laughs> good at speaking to... Um... Sort of people who would maybe give us some kit and things like that so um but it, i mean that, that was the sort of planning bit i mean i think on the bike um you know uh, so so raz would um though i did the, the the sort of overall route beforehand um raz would do the navigation on the bike because um you know a lot of the time depending on where you are particularly you know, riding in some of the countries we, we rode in, it can be quite challenging. So, you know, she rather than me sort of looking down at my Wahoo or, or whatever it is, you know, she'd be just sort of directing me. And and also if we were, if we were doing, you know, really fast descents, which we did um, on a few occasions, you know, she would just sort of call out the, it's a bit like rally driving, really, you'd be calling out, you know, a really sharp turn or whatever. So I can kind of concentrate on the road and and, uh, and we had to, uh, you know, for Guinness, they, they do require quite a bit of evidence. So, you know, things like photography and, you know, doing a bit of videoing and things like that. So Raz would do all of that and feed me as well, which was the other important <laughs> thing. So she's sort of yeah. <laughs> making so sure. One of my main responsibilities too is, yeah, I have a nose bag and I have to keep, keep Steve fueled. Time, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Typical so, Stoker job, yeah. and then Kat, when you were um, when you were planning the route, did you um, did you do? Uh, were you thinking of like a tandem specific route? Like I've been quite conscious of the fact that tandems don't always like going up hills, for example. Um, and then yeah. your route as well, it varied quite a lot from like the other round the world routes. So the ones that Mark Beaumont, Jenny Graham did. Yeah. Um, no, I mean gonna... we wanted the route. We wanted the route to be fun. Um, so you know, if you if you speak to Jenny Graham, which you, you may well do, you know, you'll you'll hear that some of her route was really not fun. You know, I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, and um, you know, so we so it wasn't the past. It's not the fastest route. Um, you could certainly do a faster route, and but you know, we had a specific record to break, which was the men's record. That's what we were. I mean, obviously, we haven't broken the men's record in the sense that we're not men, but you know, we wanted to be faster than the men. Yeah. And so we knew what we needed to do. And so we did a route that was actually would be hopefully enjoyable and interesting, um, as well as, um, you know, it's so we weren't thinking, you know, we just go over the hills on the tandem, to be honest. We, you know, we, we, it, it, when we were starting to get sort of tired towards the end, you know, you'd sometimes think, oh, and then you'd, you'd maybe look for, a, you know, a flatter route. But, but for the most part, when we were going, across Europe, um, you know, in particular, and, and, and to a certain extent, India and, and uh, Southeast Asia, you know, you just, we just go over, you know, it would be very rare, we'd, we'd sort of yeah. go around them. Um, and because Europe, Europe's pretty hilly, you know, Turkey's pretty hilly. Um, 
never underestimate Spain. That's pretty Spain, yeah, when we're no, coming back from Spain, <laughs> we went straight over Sierra Nevada mountains yeah. and then over the Pyrenees. So, you know, and that we were pretty tired by that point. And, and also, you know, it was, um, we're trying to get back because of the pandemic as well. So, um, you know, we just, you know, we, I think the route though, what we did with it was um, it followed a lot of coastlines. Um, so it was nice to be near the water and, you know, um, uh, so it was, you know, and, and also, we're, yeah, we're conscious of women as well. You know, some of the countries, you know, two women traveling together, um, you know, it can be a bit challenging if, you know, if you're in Lycra, and, you know, that sort of thing. So we, we were sort of conscious of that as well. Um, so, yeah, that, that was the route. <laughs> Uh, it obviously it panned out very well and that was one of the things I was going to ask actually was what what were the responses like in different countries was it kind of better than you expected worse than you expected did you get any strange experiences or I mean I think genuine generally for you know people who have traveled the world particularly on bicycle they're very positive experiences but how was it for you particularly as you know a pair of women on a bike I think it was fantastic and in many respects we didn't have any negative things at all everybody was incredibly generous and the hosp- you know their hospitality and they were lovely and we were you know genuinely surprised how amazing people were I think um Kat will tell you a little bit more but I about New Zealand the tra- the um they really it's not a personal thing to us but Kiwi drivers do not like cyclists of any description and lots of people say um, road cycling in New Zealand is is more challenging. Cars, they pass you literally to your shoulder and they zoom by and um, of all the countries, um, the Kiwis were it once in their car, they're really lovely people um, <laughs> out and about but put them in a car and they, they turn... Um, turn really slightly uh, yeah aggressive actually yeah that's um yeah I have heard that before actually and it, it seems quite unbelievable at the time but yeah I've heard it one too many times now that you just think wow that's it's, it's just a strange um strange idea to have because they're known as being quite kind of an outdoorsy nation oh, yeah. but... no completely and I've lived in New Zealand and I know the Kiwis really well and uh, in fact my son is a Kiwi and so I was really very sad to um, have such a kind of an aggressive, only when you're on the bike, um, mm-hmm. it really, the road, the infrastructure, whatever it is, they uh, are less terrible. I mean, other countries, America was amazing. I mean, uh, India was amazing. I mean, people are lovely, but I think uh, we found it kind of hard, didn't we, Kat, in us? In, uh, yeah, on the, on, yeah, with the, the, there was certainly in terms of, um, road etiquette that was the worst the Croatian coast is a bit as well you know so that was um um I got hit on the arm by a car on the Croatian coast um Mm. and fortunately I managed to keep us on um which you know (laughs) is not ideal really because it obviously been hit on the arm um but we we tracked her down yeah we we caught her up up. so we We? did a sprint (laughs) this like sprint on this fully loaded tandem after this woman who'd i think there was a bit of adrenaline peak and was right let's get her and uh (laughs) caught her up at the lights and um said do you realize do you realize you hit hit us and apparently she was very i mean she couldn't speak english so it was a bit of a pointless exercise to be quite honest (laughs) but she uh apparently she apologized so um made us feel better anyway yeah (laughs) (laughs) oh wow and then um i think kind of other challenges you you had some fairly significant weather bushfires you you seem to really cop some yeah (laughs) yeah and i I assume you looked at the route and you you knew what whether you you thought you were expecting but you had a few bits and bobs thrown in the mix as well yeah i mean they, they they so i suppose um I mean, we, we set off and there was actually a heat wave in Europe. Um, so I, I don't know if you remember, um, there was like a, France had something like 35 degrees or something like that. You know, it was just a couple of weeks. And so we set off in that. Uh, it was really actually, it was something like 35 degrees the first day in London. It was just scorching. And um, and then we um, 
the monsoon rains were extended. So it was actually, you know, very unusual monsoon. Um, so we, we knew we were catching the tail end of the monsoon, um, but it, you know, it carried on. It was pretty wet. So we got pretty bad saddle sore um, because we were just getting wet every day. And then in Australia, um, it was all the bushfires. So, you know, um, that was, uh, you know, that we, we had to change our routes as a consequence of that. Um, um, cause the, the, the fires were predominantly up the, the Gold Coast, um, up sort of around Sydney and, and north of Sydney and we were heading to Brisbane. So we had to go inland through an area of drought where it hadn't rained for three years. Um, and that was pretty challenging. You know, the temperatures were up to sort of 45, 45 degrees. It was, uh, yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty, pretty tough it, riding conditions for sure. Yeah, no, definitely. And yeah, that, it all, all adds to the challenge, doesn't it? And I suppose you can't expect to get the whole way around the world without having a few bits and bobs um, thrown in. But I think, yeah, you had yeah, the short end of the stick at times, certainly. Um, and Kat, how was there anywhere that was kind of the hardest in terms of like motivation? Was there anywhere that was like a real slog that you, you kind of was tricky to keep going? Or was it, did you just both spur each other on? Um not tricky to keep going because we're very focused um i think the the bit that i i found probably the hardest was actually crossing america um the central bit and that was predominantly because um so you know like the the seven kind of the southern states um which is quite flat it's not difficult cycling um but it but nutritionally it's um it's like a food desert and uh i don't do particularly well on you know fried fried sort of you know food that you know that, that's, that's not particularly nutritionally sound and it's very difficult to eat um well um and uh, i think that that was the bit that i found in some ways you know bodily I was getting tired then as well it was you know towards the end um the, probably the toughest, ironically, because actually the cycling, you know, the cycling wasn't difficult. It wasn't difficult cycling. It was, you know, because it is quite, it's pretty, I mean, once you've climbed, you know, you, you climb out of, um, the, you know, we climbed sort of out of Los Angeles and there's, um, you know, you, 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 you've got to go over the, uh, the Great Divide. Um, so, you know, you climb, it's about, you know, I think we're climbing 50 miles one day and, you know, um, but once you get onto that plateau, you know, it's, um, it, you know, and we quite like the desert, but, you know, just, just dropping into, you know, bef before and after we were in New Orleans, um, you know, that, that was it, that it, there's just no food other than crap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like crap on a, on a, on a podcast. Which didn't help. Well, we were also sponsored to stay out of McDonald's. Not that we ever ate the McDonald's, but coffee and pastries or waffle, you know, things for breakfast. We we did go, but then we were um somebody sponsored us to stay out. So even when <laughs> it might have been McDonald's was the only place to reasonably get, you know, anything, we uh we couldn't. So uh, we had lots of debates whether actually we should just do it. We should just eat <laughs> or and, and forgo the money or we should do it and not. To, anyway, we had a lot of uh, interesting talks, but we really <laughs> didn't go in and we didn't even use the toilets and we didn't use. Oh, wow. Well, we had a spot. So we thought, I bet he'll be watching us. I bet somebody <laughs> will know exactly where we Satellite are. Satellite tracking and then has sort of stopped outside it. Because people did follow us, yeah. actually. You know, they, they, they did know. We, we'd sometimes get a message exactly. saying, you're just about to go to so-and-so. And we'd say, oh, <laughs> are we? And then we would be, you know, because they'd actually be yeah. watching where we were going. So it was kind of yeah. slightly spooky. Yeah. But... <laughs> yeah, it's weird, isn't it? And yeah, it'd be great to have people follow us around the world. But it's quite a, a strange concept as well. But I think that's quite an achievement. I must admit, we don't we don't normally frequent McDonald's at all. But when we're on the long distance rides, we do a lot of old axing and things like that at two o'clock in the morning. But the only place there seems to be open. nothing better. Exactly. <laughs> and, it's and, a and in America, so. it's, it's literally the only place you can eat in some, some of these places. There's yeah. nowhere else. Yeah. You know, so yeah. it was Gosh, actually quite, quite a challenge. There was quite a bit of swearing involved in 
<laughs> yeah, good coffee, good coffee, and kind of yeah, a waffle and a pastry is what we were kind of was our bit of our diet. But yeah, no, we so that made it even more fun just to find somewhere else. But you know, sometimes there was literally nothing of any unless it came out of a can or it mm, was absolutely yeah. Nothing. It was all- I mean, we rode there was one day we rode 150 miles on two half cans of beans and um oh. and a, a you know one of those pots of macaroni oh, cheese that you pour water on <laughs> and it's like oh, oh dear god you know i am there was literally there was there wasn't a cafe for 140 miles and uh know. yeah and, and then it was just it was just sort of you know awful <laughs> awful awful not a lot of fruit and vegetables and things either. That's not mm. um, that's not a, seems to be doesn't seem to be a priority yeah. whether it's expensive or whatever going on. Yeah, it's quite scary, isn't yeah. it? So, that, that's what I, yeah. I you know I'm not you know buzz buzz is like a dustbin. She can kind of eat anything and throw it. Anything <laughs> I'm much more sensitive. <laughs> indigestion yeah. though yeah it does yeah. yeah i won't eat any old thing but it doesn't seem to uh it doesn't matter what i eat it doesn't uh, mm. kind of affect me i think that's for sure yeah i just eat yeah. it <laughs> yeah and that's going to be one of the challenges did you have a stove with you as well could you do any yeah we did in europe um I and mean, there's some mm. funny stories about me and my stove um but we <laughs> you know for the we sort of um I mean, you wouldn't use it in Asia. Um, so mm. we we kind of um, left it actually in in Europe because you know we were just cutting down on weight. She wouldn't, you wouldn't camp. You know, two women wouldn't camp in in, um, in India or in, in Southeast Asia. It's you know everybody yeah. would be joining you in the tent and things. Um, <laughs> yeah. So. You know, and it's cheap enough to, to find places to stay. So we we left the the stove. So we didn't have the stove um, on the way back. But even if we'd have had the stove, there'd have been nothing to cook. You know, there was a, and so <laughs> suggests you might actually be able to buy some vegetables or something. You know? <laughs> That's not an option. Just, yeah, definitely not plum tomatoes. And <laughs> yeah, it's not. I wouldn't have. It's like <laughs> fantasizing. It was like scurvy. You know, something you're going to get. So. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, I can see myself. Yeah, carrying cans of broad beans or something around the world just to <laughs> make sure yeah. there's something edible. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah. So obviously, Southeast Asia is, is. It sounds like it's it's very easy to find accommodation and things like that. But um, but in this one to Raz, how was it kind of finding accommodation around the world? Was there always somewhere to stop? Um, were there any kind of highlights? <laughs> Well, we um, camped, as Kat said, you know, we camped a lot um, through Europe and things, and I just love the tent, and I, it's just fantastic when we wild camped and where we could. Um, getting accommodation was not, uh, only once or so it was a bit, a bit challenging, but on the whole, um, it was fine. And one time we um, stayed in a hotel that hadn't actually opened. It was absolutely beautiful. It was the it was four star and I managed, I was chatting to the guy and managed to, he, they invited us in and I think it was really expensive, but I said, you know, I get offered them a little bit, which was the equivalent of 10 or 12 pounds. I think it was probably a little bit more. Anyway, they, we had a room and then we went down to look um, for some food and they had the restaurant open, but it was a private party and they invited us in and we ate and then they, had bre- we had breakfast and um, I think they liked taking the photographs of us, um, which were great in exchange, but it was the most, I just sat there thinking, actually, do you know what? I never want to get out of this bed or the shower. Or <laughs> it was beautiful. But yeah, so we had some real highlights. We had some unusual places when, um, yeah, the people sleeping on the floor just outside the door and unusual things like that. But I would absolutely, when you're cycling and when you're going around and you're, it's particularly in Asia, make sure they change the sheets and they'll say they're clean, but they're really not. And uh, oh my goodness, just follow them to the, the laundry and get some clean sheets and put them on yourself. <laughs> Top tip. Great tip. Yeah, no, that's a great tip. One of the things about you know, ch- traveling with a nurse, you know, you kind of end up. These, these sheets, <laughs> these sheets are not clean. <laughs> yeah, I'm not clean. Hospital corners, you know, on the bed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
a few standards that need to be maintained. <laughs> no, I think that's that's very true indeed. Um, yeah, and the um, not only did you yeah obviously break the world record, um, you've also been named the top in the top one hundred women cycling recently as well. I noticed, which is fantastic achievement. Congratulations! Yeah, yeah we're that. really pleased that we're actually in the um, sporting hero section which was with all the pro cyclists yeah. so I, so we're pretty pleased about that kind of um, as an um, Lizzie Dengen you know it was like yay <laughs> yeah no definitely I think so and have you found that you've inspired have you heard back from um, anybody you've inspired aside from us um, particularly like other women because you know you as you say that is the men's record before and uh, I think these sort of challenges you often think about, you know, young bearded men setting off intrepidly. Um, so as anybody that's kind of seen what you've done and kind of gone, oh, actually, you know, you've kind of made me, me think well, about. It's funny you should say that because this, well, we're this week, l last week, just last week, we got an email through our, our website from a 14 year old girl saying amazing like, such a lovely email just saying that um you know from a feminist from a feminist point of view and cycling and we bring them both together and just asking that she lives in america and has started cycling with her father and just the loveliest email that uh, and saying you know you've in, inspired me to cycle and have you in so i we took um quite a bit of time to uh, email her back um it was just that was out of the blue and absolutely lovely. And it, it kind of really made my week just thinking, actually, somebody that we've never seen in another country um, sees, saw what we've done and actually thinks it's all right. I love it. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. And I bet there's tons more out there. I think it's just it's whether you hear about them or not, isn't it? And yeah, we've had a lot of people we... contact us for sure. And, you know, and I think as yeah, we were going round um because i was blogging every day and it sounds like you read some of that blog um i think i've read most of it <laughs> <laughs> then um you know we we had we had lots of people sort of um you know sort of comment on the blog and, and contact us and um and that that yeah. that was really nice and it was it was nice you know as we were doing it because um you know it kind of you know I think also because we were doing it for charity and, you know, some of those people were from the M&D community in particular, you know, you yeah, just, it, you know, it, it kind of inspired you, you know, you'd know that, um, that certainly some, if they wrote that, that post with eye gaze, for example, um, you know, because many of them are, are, are unable to, um, to speak or move, then, you know, it probably took them, you know, the morning to write a few lines or whatever. And then you kind of thought, well, actually, you know what I mean? It puts everything in perspective, doesn't it? Amazing. So. But also one thing uh, that we did that is was really helpful and useful is we had little calling cards with our contacts on and um, how they could kind of ta uh, Twitter and uh, Instagram and things Tweet. that we, we do. <laughs> Tweeting. Yes, I've been trying to learn how to tweet. <laughs> so cats are Twitter, uh, and um, and then the charities that we're riding on, but they're really small and they're not taking up a lot of weight. And then you could just, you know, hand them because as we left, we were chatting to a police officer uh, in London at the traffic lights. This woman saying, "My goodness, where are you going and what are you doing?" And I gave her a card, and she sponsored us, and that was just oh, absolutely amazing. lovely. She, you know, we were hoping she'd kind of clear the road a little bit because a lot of traffic. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's a bit blue lighted through London. You know, which is kind of yeah. <laughs> was just in London and that was really encouraging and then you know that evening to see that she'd sponsored us I don't know there's little little kicks you get yeah. a little yeah it's really nice yeah. but they're only you know those small calling cards it's just easy yeah. you got um, a pile printed up so easy peasy and you'd, you'd always yeah. in India you'd, you'd have to wherever you stay the bit the obligatory photo with all the staff before you set off <laughs> the next day you know yeah. <laughs> every day obligatory selfies <laughs> <laughs> um, and which was lovely you know it's um it's um yeah it's, it's certainly an interesting country to uh, to travel yeah. in um, yeah i think it'll be you'll have the best time i can't i wish we were doing it again actually <laughs> yeah yeah you never know you never know one day <laughs> um 
and I think that's, that's the other kind of big thing as well. I think you've, you've raised an immense amount of money for your charities, um, for the MND charity, it's motor neuron disease, isn't it? And Oxfam as well was your, your second charity too. And I think, yeah, you know, <laughs> that would have, it would have, on top of everything else, it's really the icing on the cake, isn't it? And yeah, I've, you, you must be absolutely over the moon with, with what you've achieved. I think. I think that we were so touched because it wasn't big corporate sponsorship. It wasn't, it was individuals and people giving us anything from two pounds to 20 pounds to 30 pounds. And all of those small donations made up. So there were hundreds of people that gave us money and we were really touched by it. And we did this, um, uh, they could, because we were cycling between a hundred and well, 80 and a hundred miles people could spend if they did, give us between 80 and 100 pounds they could choose a day and we dedicate it to them and um, either in memory or in celebration and we had I had a lot of people and then Kat and I would have to think of the music or they would tell us what music to listen to and then we'd have to think of the dedication and the pictures for that day for them and we would kind of upload it but lots of people asked us to cycle in memory I suppose you know it's the M&D charity and there was lots mm. of people um, asking us to cycle in memory of people and I found one particular challenging one a colleague um, asked me to cycle for her her child that had died and we had to do um, that um, but it was just amazing and really moving and people were so lovely and so they'd give us the money and then family members would uh, donate too on those days. Mm. I mean I remember there was one time we were in the middle of Australia um, and um, we um, we found a we found some well like a pub and they said we could they could oh, stop yeah. in the in their garden and uh, we went into the we went in and we were kind of searching for food really um, which was generally what we did in the evening and the guy there was a big bunch of guys you know big truckers and they all said oh you've got to go to the club you know go to the club you'll get get some food there. And we're thinking, oh my goodness, you know, what is this club going to be? And so we went across to this this club, and actually, clubs in Australia are like the kind of like I suppose community venues where people in the community get together. So they're not. We were thinking some you know dodgy club, um, and it, it wasn't that at all. And um, they were having a fundraising event on that night, and they ended up sort of fundraising for us, you know, because they heard that we were in town and. You know, so we ended up, you know, eating at the club, and and then they did yeah. a big, and you know, we had to do speeches <laughs> in, this, in this thing, and um, you know, see, so that was the thing about it. You, you never, you know, if, you, if somebody had said that to you at the start of the day, oh well, you know, tonight you'll be in a club giving a speech, you would never have expected it. Um, but and that that was the thing, you know, something happened kind of every every day, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And people were incredibly kind and, and generous. And I think particularly the Aussies, you know, I think the Aussies in those rural communities where I think there is a culture of really sort of helping people because it's really hard living, living out there is the truth of it. And yeah. so, um, so that was, that was nice. And that was, I guess that was an example of the, some of the support we had around the world really. Yeah, no, that sounds, that sounds amazing. It's those little experiences, those touch of humanity that I think, just really make make a trip like this um and uh, one of the, the kind of most exciting parts i find of your your story which we've um, not mentioned yet is your kind of race to the finish line how you i think if i'm wrong but i think it's the second to last ferry you got in before lockdown hit and yeah that kind of kind of uh, kind of curtailed I think your homecoming a little bit and I kind of yeah obviously you've um, you've been featured in Guinness quite a lot and yeah the, the 100 um, women cycling thing is amazing too but I've, I feel like we we might have heard a lot more about you too if um, a good old coronavirus hadn't <laughs> kind of happened um, are you going to take the opportunity to do more talks have you got like more footage is there kind of more to come from from you guys I think it would be lovely to do that and to do um, some talks. I think at the moment, we I mean, we have done lots, but they've all been on like this, on um, kind of Zoom and MS Teams. And, and um, until people start kind of having kind of meetings and grouping groups and things, it would be nice. We'll, we'll be up for sharing and hopefully um, getting other people to, particularly women, to get on the bike 
and to cycle even it doesn't have to be around the world you know every time you go out there's a kind of a mini adventure to be had and um, we you know hopefully people will start to cycle more probably i think you know that that's one thing that um, the pandemic has done cycling has uh, has really taken off in a in a major way you can't get a bike for love and money now <laughs> you need because of all the yeah parts and things so um yeah no it's it's great yeah we've got a long wait for our tandem of our it's it's on order now but it's not expected till november purely because of the situation with parts and everything it's it's hard to hard to get so we've got a tandem to practice on but the actual beasts that will come around the world we won't be seeing for a while yet because of the yeah the ordering situation and cat is there in what's next for tandem wow is there are there any other plans are you um going to be doing anything else or is it just purely riding for fun now yeah, we, 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 we may, you know, we may do, we may look at some, some other records, probably shorter ones. Yeah. Um, but it, it's been, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been a, a sort of a, um, you know, an odd period really, you know, in terms of, yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, trying to sort of focus on that. And also, um, though we, we have been uh, training um you know being able to sort of i mean there was quite a long time you know when we, could, we didn't actually see each other and we couldn't couldn't train and we haven't really trained on the tandem you know we've been training on solos um so i think you know i think i think we'll see we'll see you know what um you know what we what we fancy doing we're doing next week we're, well next week week after next we're doing um chase the sun which is a like 200 mile across the country oh fab you yeah. know um so that'll that'll be fun you know and that's probably you know the longest longest distance um i mean see you know you do the 200 miles in the day but you know longest distance we've done you know for, for for a while so um you know we've done a bit of training training for that um and um yeah and then we'll we'll sort of see you know i mean it took me a while to recover actually from the from the ride mm. um you know i wasn't quite um quite expecting that um so you know so and I think also depending on the sort of riding that you're going to do, you know, if you you don't, you know, you don't ride, obviously at, um, you know, we're all getting technical anaerobic threshold and things like that. When you're going around. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, we'd be riding very much in kind of endurance, you know, for, for a long yeah. time. So you know, kind of getting to the point where you 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 know you're training a little bit differently was, um, you know, so we've been we've been kind of working on that. And now we're coming out of lockdown. We'll, maybe think about some other things to do but we kind of part it really you know given given everything else yeah. that was going on yeah no amazing i'll certainly be keeping a watch to to see what you to get up to next because yeah it's, it's really exciting and i think yeah as you say i think you're a massive inspiration particularly to to women as to how to get out there on the bike um i've just if you've got enough time i've just got a bit of tandem trivia for the pair <laughs> of you <laughs> it's not too awful i promise um it usually starts with have you ridden a tandem but i think you two um can answer that, think, that, that think, pretty easily so to say that we have <laughs> <laughs> very thoroughly um so i'll start with you kat um apart from raz obviously um if you could ride a tandem with anybody in the world or even alive or dead anybody at all who would you put on your tandem oh my and you're not allowed to say me. Yes. <laughs> oh my goodness me um well, I'd have to say I'd have to say my my uh, my wife actually, um, yeah. yeah yeah. So um, yeah, that's who I you know was uh, doing some tandem riding with. So <laughs> amazing. Yeah. And would you still be on the? Are you still are you still pilot then yeah. as well? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I'm always the pilot. I'm terrible. I'm a terrible stoker. Is the truth of it as well? That that's what what Raz <laughs> didn't actually say that um, you know that I'm I'm actually I'm actually terrible on the back because. Uh, you yeah, know, I'm so used to being on the front. <laughs> it's actually quite hard. It's it's it is actually yeah. It takes a lot of getting used to. I think it's a special skill being a stoker. So I've got a lot of respect for Raz. <laughs> um, and Raz, how about you? If you could ride a tandem with anybody alive or dead that's not cat, who would it be? I think um, I've had a few moments to think about it very quickly. I think um, Victoria would would be on my tandem. Oh, fantastic! Yeah. Uh, where would, would you still be in the stoker seat? Um, yeah, because I'm sure she's more chilled than Kat. <laughs> <laughs> Very 
very good. <laughs> and we would, yeah, no, it would be great fun. Yeah, we'd have lots of fun. Amazing. Um, and then as well, me and Steve said we're joined by by the frame on our tandem. Um, it's inseparable. What um, what items or food or kit would you say that you are um, inseparable from? I'll start with with cash again. What what kind of could you so, not do without? So we, we actually did have um, a luxury item each um, that we took with us. So so we had all of our sort of this is you know kit we can't survive without and then we, we we allowed ourselves a luxury item and mine was an espresso maker so it's like a portable espresso maker which you could argue <laughs> it is actually central kit to be honest but that would be um that would be my item well if it gets you going in the morning <laughs> yeah there you go <laughs> and and we stopped and had yeah that was uh, that espresso was fantastic and i had a bose a micro speaker that went on the handlebars and we listened to um podcasts and books and um, music we did lots of singing and uh, yeah lots of music we listened to yeah I think there's a lot to be said for motivation and you know it's those little perks that keep you going so I think yeah yeah that um, makes a, a big big difference um and last not not least um why should we ride a tandem around the world and any last tips for us when we do I just think it's just such a great experience and um you know i think seeing the world by bike is you know the most perfect way to to see it and you know you find that every day is an adventure so yeah you know i think enjoy it and i would say and i hate to say this but um and it was cat's idea and i was a bit horrified to begin with but actually cycle and definitely just cycle in shimano sandals don't wear shoes just wear the sandals because you can get wet your feet if you read the, the blogs from the other guys they had manky foot rot uh, just because of ah. the heat they're sweaty in shoes they rain they got full of water they never dried and the sandals we didn't take any other shoes and we just wore the sandals and apart from getting stripy feet from our suntan, which was quite hilarious <laughs> when we did go swimming or anything. But um, they were probably, the that was one of the best things that uh, we did. And not shoes, they're bad, bad, bad. But um, the sandals, I hate to say it, were really, really good. Even that's the, that's the really kind of interesting, grand, actually. Granddad's sand, sand, sandals. <laughs> yeah, and and Raz said at the beginning that she yeah. never wore them with socks, and she did. And and I did, and I wore them with socks, and then we put overshoes on them in America when it was cold. So our feet were always that well. They never. We didn't have to use um, gallons of talcum powder and try to dry them, or they weren't. They were just fresh and fine. Always. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll see if I can talk Steve into that. I think I think he's he's approaching the right age that he should definitely be thinking about a sock sandal combination. I could say yeah. that because he's well, <laughs> yeah I can't yeah even I am uh, yeah I'm amazed I, I'm actually amazed I'm saying this but it was the best thing and uh, we didn't normally wear them with socks um we just wore the sandals but when it was chilly really cold in America and some places in, the, in uh, New Zealand we did we got shoe covers and uh, we wore them and they were great really good oh fantastic well, thank you both so so much um, for for coming on and for chatting and for both being such a, an amazing inspiration. We we might not be thanking you at some point when we realise half, halfway around the world what we've got ourselves into. But no, I think you two are just absolutely amazing. So I, I really appreciate you chatting to me and yeah, following your. Thank you, and I'm looking forward <laughs> to following you in your adventures and seeing what you get up to oh, yeah, good, good luck. luck with that thank you so much <laughs> yeah